Welcome back, Amy and Karen. This is such a wonderful film. I, I know the audience enjoyed it as much as, as I did. It, it is so dense and there are so many amazing elements to this film. And I think we're gonna need more than the prerequisite 20 minutes to talk about this. Maybe about two, two and a half hours should be fine. But I do wanna talk a little bit about the beginnings of this project. And obviously we were all so saddened by Jamie's passing and he did not get to be at the premiere. But uh, going back even further to the development of this, uh, I understand that you were friends, Amy, with Jamie mm -hmm. and uh, Karen, uh, you had a lot to deal with in terms of determining whether this film would uh, be something Jamie was interested in doing and meaning you brought it up. Could you kind of start at the beginning there, Karen? For sure. Us? Well, uh, Jamie and I were working on another film about play, about the need for adults to find joy and play. We, we, we've done a lot of sort of okay, issue films I mean, that were difficult stuff to deal with. And we had found our audience of people who were dealing with difficult issues. Uh, and I, we both kept saying, need to do something different for our own sake. Uh, but also for our, you know, the people that we were, who were seeing our films. And uh, I had seen Amy perform in the rock bottom remainders uh, at one of their uh, appearances at, at the opening of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, because how can you tell the Rolling Stones, you can't open, Bob Dylan, you can't open, but everybody <laughs> bowed to Stephen King, you know, Amy Tan and, uh, you know, Dave Barry, and they rocked, right? They were great. And I had only known Amy and still until I threw her work. And I was just like, this is great. And I just thought the playfulness and the, and I sort of imagined all these writers going, you know, Stephen King is off in his room, imagining all these horrible things, you know, and, and Amy's doing her thing and how great to come together. Cause it was also obvious the community and joy uh, and fun that they had. And I, I did say to Jamie, you know, I know you're friends with Amy Tan, you know, can you, that, that would be just such a great thing in our film for her to talk about that. I imagine it's a, it's a great thing. And, you know, he said he would, and Amy was going through a very difficult time, but also her, her sister had died, but she was going to do a performance literally like the next week when he called. Great performance, which you saw in the film, you know, not the Amy Tan that you think of. <laughs> Uh, we were and 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 uh, and it was doing everything for our film. The centerpiece of our film, he interviewed Amy, and she was so articulate about imagination, about finding. And I, I said to Jamie, Amy needs her own film. <laughs> I, you know, we, we have to do something about Amy, really. And and um, it was funny because. I thought we could still keep the rock bottom remainder stuff. <laughs> you know, we lost our play film. <laughs> we did go back and we found a, a wonderful, you know, great group of people, including Lester Holt, who dashes off from assignments to go play in a jazz club with his friends who were cameramen and editors. And so Amy, you know, Amy then can take over, but I, I, Jamie was hesitant to ask her to be in a whole film and do a whole film. I, I was just kind of like, we, you know, we should do this. She, it's, she need, people need to understand, and we, <laughs> this needs to be here. Um, and uh, you know, he used his his charm, um, but really, the thing that uh, well, Amy can take it from there. But that is why we did it. We, you know, and I just had faith that. Amy is an American master. She is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. and the folks at American Masters from very early on were very encouraging that they would very much like really without, without seeing the little footage that we had from the, from the interview that we had done about play said, yes, we'd be very, very interested, go ahead. And so, you know, and ask. Uh, and so then. Yeah. <laughs> So then, Amy, then, then, uh, then the hard part started. <laughs> yeah, because Amy, um, uh, even as recently as your your last book, and uh, which I hope we can talk more more about, you previously you were very private in in, in many respects. I would have loved to have been mm -hmm. a fly on the wall. So now we have that opportunity to be. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I had actually made a vow to myself not to be so public and to go more into a private world um, so I could do other things. And my joke was not to be asked to uh, be on an honorary committee for a gala. Um, no one would think of me. Jamie and I had, during that time we were talking about play, he, we talked a lot about trauma, about pain, about resilience, all the subjects that had been in previous films that he and Karen had made. Um, and I think that naturally this was starting to formulate in his mind that it would it'd be great. But he knew I would always say things, whether I was being interviewed for play, I'd say, well, how much time do you really need for this? I can give you one hour or uh, you, if you do this uh, for the play document, I can only do such and such. And so he knew by asking me to do more, I might not be that receptive. And I did in fact say, um, you know, I, I, that's too public for me. Um, it also would require time. And Jamie said, no, we have most of the interview done. <laughs> maybe, maybe just one more interview <laughs> or maybe one with your husband. You know, he's maybe come over for sandwiches at lunch and we talk about other things. But I, I do have to say it was because Jamie and I shared a big commonality and that was pain and trauma and resilience. And he was going through a lot of pain. He was in a lot of physical pain. And I knew that whatever he did had to be incredibly meaningful. And he felt that he was gonna find that in doing that. Um, and at one point, I just, I just finally said, you know, I said to myself, my need for privacy is, is not more important than Jamie doing this project that he thinks is going to be the, an important one as he is facing the possibility of dying. And I said to him, um, you have enough uncertainty in your life. You don't have to keep coming back here to do these lunches and buy me sandwiches. <laughs> Let's just do it, no hesitation, no. And, you know, and I thought to myself, what could be so bad about having these really wonderful, intimate conversations with somebody I absolutely trusted? I never would have done this with anyone else. But Jamie, I absolutely trusted him. And also knowing he was a kind person, he wasn't going to do anything that would make me feel uncomfortable. Well, I, we're so happy that uh, you were able to work with him in that way. Otherwise we would have wound up with what, a 10 minute short. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, but, I, you know, I did say to him, I'm not that famous, you know, and, but you know, nothing really dissuaded him. And, yeah. Well, I, I look at this film really as a gift, your, your candidness and, and, and the way that you view your work and your life and your past all seems to come together. It's like you're juggling all these incredible variables that important variables, maybe variables isn't really the right word, but things that we have to deal with in life, some people more than others. And it, it just becomes a film that is dense in the sense that it covers so many different topics of great importance, but it, it has such a fluidity to it. And I think the combination of all of you together, and certainly in the interviews with Jamie and yourself, it's right there, as they say on the page, but it's right there in, in the film. So it's wonderful. But um, you talk also in the film a lot about, you know, all the expectations that, you know, people have put on you as, you know, a spokesperson person for this generation or for Chinese American first generation people or, um, and, and, even to the point, and I want to ask you about this too later, uh, Karen, in terms of social impact and uh, sometimes some criticism saying, well, you know, this really, you need to be out there and advocating for change within your writings. And I've always been uh, of the school that uh, the best films and the most important films are universal. And, uh, and as we know, Roger Ebert talked about film as being an empathy machine. And when you talk about justice and, um, and doing things that are positive, to me, it's these little stories that make the difference that 
you know, Willie Loman's story is as important as Lawrence of Arabia's. And so uh, I love the scenes also having Isabel Allende there. So what do you think about um, in terms of social impact documentaries and uh, the criticism you've had and in relationship to film, uh, not just writing though? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I um, certainly want uh, any messages from my work to be ones that serve social justice, but I cannot approach my work with this idea that I must use it to serve that purpose directly because then my work becomes didactic. It takes on a different form. But as you said, if I can make somebody feel the characters, feel the emotions of the character, they are more likely to get that, whatever the message is uh, about those things. So um, I think it naturally comes out. I, I also feel that the more specific I am, the more personal I am in my writing, the ironically, the more universal it becomes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because somehow these situations, even though they're different, um, in, the, in the outer trimmings that you see, it is the um, emotions that people have experienced, whether it's, you know, secrets, misunderstandings, uh, an absolute need at some point to connect. Jamie found that through line and he was taking all of it, the expectations, but also the people who felt that I failed their expectations, which is naturally going to happen. Um, I, you know, you can't serve all people. The, the nature of my fiction, is going to be based on personal things. For example, that my grandmother was raped, became a concubine and killed herself. There are a lot of people who say, that's one of those old time stereotypes. We don't need stories like that. And I just think uh, we don't need mothers who speak in broken English. And I just thought, well, this is my reality. And this is how uh, the influences in my family were passed along. So I can't listen to all of those expectations. Um, I do have to simply be true to myself. And Jamie was very good in presenting um, both sides and saying, here's, you know, people who identified and people who were very critical. And, and that's very real. And I, I'm glad he put that in there. Um, there was one request that I did make to him, and that was, please don't ask me to call on famous people and see if they will say something in the documentary. <laughs> Not that he intended to do that. I said, if you want to have anybody in this film, I would like you to be the person to do the ask because they don't want them to feel pressured. And so obviously certain people, my husband um, for one, but also Isabel Allende and Kevin Kwan, my editor, uh, you know, he did contact them and how gracious of them to actually agree to do that. And they all added valuable moments to the film. It wasn't yeah. just an awards testimonial. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And um, Karen, you know, we've probably, we've shown many of Jamie's films and your films, maybe all of them, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but pretty close. Uh, including playing for Keeps, which showed at Docklands last year. So that's kind of serendipitous. Uh, but a lot of your films um, have been social impact films too. Uh, but um, I can't uh, forget what Albert Maisel said to, to us once. He was doing a master class at Mill Valley. And he said, the most important thing that he had found was you have to love your subject. Uh, even if they're despicable and they're a <laughs> child molester, you know, in terms of making the film, of course, you, you have to have that involved. So how do, how do you look at this particular film that is different uh, than, but it, it has the, I think ultimately you got to the same place, but well, uh, 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 yeah. even though it's a- it's Different ways to, to, to answer that. First of all, it's, easy to love our subject, that that was kind of the point because, you know, making these films about childhood trauma and everything, um, 
in a way, I thought this, you know, maybe in the beginning, we thought, oh, well, this will be something a little different and different, but, but actually it's all the same thing. How do you deal with it? What is the way through and out to healing, understanding, and, 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 you know, Amy does that, her, you know, does that. And so that, we, you know, just, we became more and more <laughs> uh, in, involved and, and, I think with our other films, it was more about giving people information or, you know, in a very specific way, you know, dyslexic people are intelligent. They just read more slowly, you know, and that, but that's a huge thing, you know, and because somebody is not a good speller does not mean they're not a good thinker and could even be a good writer. Um, and so, you know, we, we, something more specific we wanted to say this, is which is what is beautiful about someone's life and why your work is so beautiful amy is because it's not trying to make a point it's not trying to it, it is simply um showing um and your process of conf confronting and understanding difficult things and using your mm. you have to have to have empathy which is how it all works for all of us, right? You, you have to have empathy for other people to, to change your own point of view. Um, and, and imagination is the super, the super fuel uh, for empathy. And people with the kind of imagination that Amy has to imagine so many different ways, it helps us see things in a different way. And I mean, I you were saying the film was enjoyable. I, I have to say, I. I cry almost every time I watch it at different parts. And it's not, it's not all sad crying. It's also, yes, we can come to a pl place where we can see someone in their pain, how they, you know, your mom caused you pain and 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 ways in which, you know, <laughs> having a mother who might want to kill herself at any moment is not a stable way <laughs> to, you know. <laughs> leave it to beaver way of growing up but that so many people blame their mother and they never they stay in that knot and it's not good for them um and it's not good for the world and your ability to you know both want to know and want to bravery and wanting to know everything from her and um, and then turning it both into fiction and into VHS tapes and, into, you know, it all work, works together. And I think that is why at least I cry each time because it, mm -hmm. it also gives me hope as a person and makes me happy that each, you know, in, in each little way, things can get better. Things mm -hmm. can. And it's interesting because I love about your previous films, how they're all there to show something positive and and things that you can do, and that was very much seen, you know, part of Jamie right. as well. And I think you get to that, like I said before, in so many different it, ways, you get to that place with this film, exactly, just doing something differently. And it really is your creativity, Amy, and how articulate you are, that enables you to kind of just pull these things that are seem disparate. Right. And they all just kind of come together. And, and even with your relationship with your mom from, uh, from the early stages when you talk about in the movie from embarrassment that she may bring Chinese food to trying to kill you and everything in between. <laughs> that, and you call it that you list started listening to her. But it is the empathy and it is the understanding and it changed your life. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, and when, why your books are so good be, because you feel <laughs> that reality, bravery, and realness. You know, I, I do have to say, my mother taught me a lot about storytelling. And one of it is, as you can see in the film, when she's talking about sex, she is unfiltered. She will talk about anything. You know, nothing is something that should be concealed. And as a writer, in writing very privately, that's also something that I'm doing. I'm, I'm bringing up things that can be uncomfortable. And it's more for me, if I'm going to ask these questions on, about how I became who I am, how did I become the writer that I am? 
that I, I need to understand where these things came from. My mother also had um, an, a need to feel very deeply and she wanted me to feel that way. And she was all, often frustrated and disappointed and angry even that I did not feel say the grief that she felt for my father and brother. Mm. I did feel grief. I did it differently. I didn't wail all day long asking why did this happen? I was angry. That was my grief that this had happened. Um, Jamie was able to take this, all these disparate pieces. And I really give him credit for this story. He's a storyteller and he took all of these things and put them into a narrative of his own design to have these elements come out. And that I think is the beauty of, of what he's done. And the surprise that I had in watching it for the first time when he gave me what was almost the final film before he died. Um, that the way he had done it, you know, with, with so, so much care and tenderness and also with honesty, it wasn't just all good stuff. Um, and, you know, he, he showed the, the difficult parts of it as well. I was a little bit, you know, kind of squirming when, when all those new stories are coming out about the Joy Luck Club and the bestseller stuff. But, you know, I, I know that that's part of it as well, this life that I have. Uh, yeah, and it's interesting too. Just one quick comment on that, that, uh, you know, when you read some re reviews, it, I only went, I read one that I thought, are you saying it's a negative to be humble and have humility? Because and I'm reading this review, <laughs> and going, that's not a negative trait. That's a positive trait. But uh, I think I, well, I will say being modest can be a negative trait because it often involves self-effacement, denial of who you are, um, putting yourself down. I am not a modest person at all. I have humility. I have, um, I feel humbled by what's happened. I don't always feel I deserve this or that what people are saying is, oh yes, of course, that's me. So I have to have humility because if I didn't, I'd be so overblown in my estimation of myself, I wouldn't be able to write, you know, thinking mm -hmm. I've, I've already got everything that I'm saying is wonderful. Um, so that's a necessity, being humble as a human, just to be a human being, a normal human being. But um, I know how to defend myself. You know, somebody oh, was that's, condescending yeah. to me. I, I'm like my mother, I could, you know, I, I, I think that core of steel came out in the movie too. <laughs> I have no doubt about that. Yeah. But um, it, it, yeah, uh, it, actually in terms of Karen, uh, I wanna move, go back to one other part. Uh, with all this material, obviously you're glad you had it and makes a, an incredible story, but uh, how did Jamie and yourself and the team deal with all this? I mean. Is as you say in the film, you just had you know bins and garage full of pictures and elements, <laughs> and as this incredible family history and stories, and your life alone, as another reviewer said, there was enough autobiographical uh, things in it to to make five fiction films uh, based on your life. Um, <laughs> how did how did your team deal with all this um. huge volume of information? Jamie was the captain there and, and you know, brilliantly uh, and, and, and the, you know, and, and including, you know, Amy's memoirs that we were listening to <laughs> and, you know, let, let's take that part and, you know, the, the audio versions of her memoirs. Um, but I think the richness allowed, because there was so much, it also allowed him to really see so many things and to be able to cut and pull. And we, we have a brilliant editor as well. Jeff is Je Jeff Boyette. Mm -hmm. is uh, really worked hand in glove and our yeah. other producer, Cassandra Jawla. And I think, you know, it's a big canvas, a lot to work with, but at the center was, was Amy. And, and I, I think um, we did have to, you know, the, you know, the, no one will see the three hour movie, but, but he, <laughs> we know he was able to put something together to cut it down. Um, and, and honestly, um, American Masters movies are usually much shorter. Um, and I, when we were talking with them, I said, we, we cannot, 
I don't want to cut this. So I don't know what we're going to do. And uh, they said, well, we aren't, we don't either. You know, we'll, we'll, we're going to get an extra long time slot that fits mm. and does justice to the complexity, the richness of, uh, of the material and who Amy, Amy is. There's so much, mm. uh, Amy, that uh, about creativity uh, that one could talk about. It's the movie is really about imagination and creativity exactly. as well as exactly. some of these other elements. And um, but I was also thinking to what you talked about before because of humility. Uh, but also there's shows this awareness in there. I think one of your comments was that how deeply what people say to you, especially people you love can affect you, that you're good at something or you're bad at something. And then we have a tendency to gravitate to what we do well. And then you look back and go, well, you know, I really wasn't that bad a, uh, a visual artist either. And I, and I find joy in, in drawing. Um, but the other element, and I don't know if it's just me, but I sense, um, the fact that writing and, and being a visual artist uh, and drawing and even music kind of inspired you in like those three parts came together in a whole that is more than the sum of its parts. And I, I'd love you to talk about that. I, I, I've experienced something like that once in, in a way that I, I always wanted to be like a lead guitarist and I, I just couldn't do it, which was very frustrating because all my family were fantastic concert musicians and singers, and I couldn't do it. But when I became a potter, the spontaneity mm -hmm. that I was looking for, being in the moment, could happen mm -hmm. when you're throwing a pot on mm -hmm. the wheel. You have to be there 100% yeah. yeah. present. And it was satisfying for me in the way that I couldn't do with music. Uh, could I have been a musician if I worked harder? I doubt it, but maybe, <laughs> but, uh, but you, you don't even want to go there. Could you, could you kind of, I know I threw a lot at you right now. <laughs> you on that, it'd be great. It's in a way, it's astonishing to me that all these different parts of my life, the music, the art, the writing, um, all came together, is coming together more and more as the years go by. Um, and as was said in the in the documentary, I was told by my art teacher that I I had no creativity, no imagination. Um, fortunately, I didn't believe that, but it did stop me from pursuing a career in art. Not that I could, because you know I imagined myself not making any money, and that would certainly be a problem. I was a very realistic person. Um, what the commonality I find, there are a number of them. One is that I love working by myself. I can play piano by myself. Piano to me is an emotional story, often, especially something like a concerto or prelude. Um, a drawing to me is a meditative um, experience. I'm not trying to do anything super creative. I'm just doing a portrait of a bird, for example, or recording what I see. And so that is, always in the moment and it's a story and so the stories I write are the, are the same way I have to go into some internal place where my emotions and my emotional memories are and I have to ask questions and bring out the questions I had as a child and merge them with the new questions of me reflecting back on that child um, and what she was thinking and what had been her experience um, in being pummeled at times by different expectations. It is, as you said, this wonderful uh, experience in life to suddenly find this is part of the meaning of your life. It doesn't have to be a public meaning. Um, it can be a private one, but it, it is one of the joys, one of the, the moments you say, yes, this is who I am. Now, I never dreamt of becoming a rock and roll singer. That was a bonus <laughs> or maybe a detour. I did actually have this fantasy of becoming the girlfriend of somebody in a band. Um, <laughs> and that never happened. But, <laughs> um, but the, the band itself, 
aside from being becoming really close friends with a number of people, we've been doing this since 1992. It taught me a lot about connecting with people because when you perform, you're not performing, you're performing perhaps the same songs, but the audience is different. And that's a huge, huge part of performance. So it taught me a lot um, in terms of what I do in public and what I say, my job is to connect and to make sure people understand um, what I'm saying. And I, and I can get to see them react. Sometimes I see them falling asleep <laughs> in the front row, but if they're laughing, then I know that they got what I was saying, that it's serious, but it's also lighthearted. It's, it's a perspective I'm, I'm trying to get across. Well, uh, thank you. Um, I think we're running out of time, though uh, I would love to do this again sometime. Uh, this has been such a pleasure to have you here, Amy and Karen. And again, it's just a, a lovely film. And uh, we know that Jamie would have been exceedingly proud of the reception it's gotten so far. And uh, I just want to congratulate you all. And thank you again for being part, being a participant in Docklands 2021. Thank you. Thank you.